Hello and welcome to The View from Maya Brown Podcast. This is a fortnightly podcast series for employment lawyers and HR practitioners which highlights developments in case law and legislative changes of importance to UK employers. It's presented by Nicholas Robertson, the head of Maya Brown's London employment team. This podcast is available via iTunes, YouTube and the Twitter feed Nicholas Robertson, Twitter handle at NicholasRobert11. It is also now available on Spotify, Google Play and Yahoo. The time spent listening to these podcasts can count towards your continuing education requirements. And at the end of the podcast, we will explain how to get in touch if you wish to claim credit for continuing education purposes or if you have any comments or questions. Hello and welcome to podcast number 174. My name is Nicholas Robertson, head of the team at Mayor Brown, um, dealing with employment law matters. Um, This is the first of a a two-part podcast. I think it's too long to to go out as one podcast. And it's looking at what is increasingly topical for employers, namely the issue of how do you uh, return to a more normal working pattern. Emphasise up front, this isn't simply about furloughed employees. This is much more widely um, applicable. So uh, employers who've been had employees working from home, employers whose businesses have been shut down, employers who have been affected generally by the pandemic in one way or another, which is surely every business, looking at the transition as the lockdown arrangements are eased. But let's start with the question. Why start thinking about a return to work now? Given that um, we're in the midst of a lockdown, there's no announcement at the point at which I'm recording this as to when and how we are going to start to um, relieve the lockdown um, in the UK. Why start thinking about a return to work now? Well, about 10 days ago, um, the other partners in the employment team and I, we were sitting um, talking about what we thought was coming next as inevitably part of what we do is trying to work out um, what do we think issues are going to be before they are uh, recognised uh, more widely. Um, and obviously, and we ourselves at that stage were at the same position, you know, most law firms, most advisors, we're focusing on the coronavirus guidance, furlough updates, etc, etc, etc. But if you think about it, that's really a transition. There's going to be a return to normal work, or more normal work, let's say. Um, you look at the um, HMRC stats. I think I think the latest says that four million people are on furlough, which is a um, colossal percentage of uh, the UK's working population. So clearly, when the scheme ends, there's going to be a major shakeout. I, I just think it's impossible to suggest it's going to be anything else. Um, part of the problem for the the government are the um, rules on collective consultation on large-scale redundancies require 45 days advance notice and as um, some of you will have already seen suggestion is that the government extended the furlough scheme from the end of May to the end of June because they were told in mid-April there were tens and tens and tens of thousands of redundancies coming in the airline industry alone and it didn't want that news breaking very sensibly didn't want that news breaking at the point at which we may or may not have been reaching our peak number of deaths in the UK uh, from the virus but there's clearly going to be a major shake-up coming um, we don't know how much notice is going to be given of the end of the furlough scheme um, there may be pushback from employers so there may be relatively short notice we're hearing stories that employers are um, the are hearing that there may be some sort of transitional arrangement from the existing furlough scheme into a more reduced furlough scheme. Now, that might, of course, be a percentage reduction in the ability to reclaim wages. We've heard a story, I think it was in the FT, that it might involve some sort of restriction on dividends being paid to shareholders. But the, clearly the existing scheme can't keep going at however many, you know, £12 billion a month or whatever it's costing the country. It can't keep going indefinitely. Next point in terms of why ask these questions now. Getting employees back to work is going to take planning, communication management. Different employees are going to give rise to different challenges. The challenges for getting a furloughed employee back to work is going to be very different from getting an employee who's been working but who's got elder care or child care issues. Business life is going to be disrupted. Planning for that is going to affect decisions um, uh, being taken in respect of employees. And we think fundamentally that there's something here about first mover advantage. Um, employers 
who've done their thinking now during the remainder of the lockdown period are going to be able to make faster and more assured progress despite all the uncertainties when things start to um, get lo- uh, relaxed and, and more normal working uh, is going to be uh, resumed. Um, and um, if you think about it in those terms, the question is not why start planning now, but where the hell do you start? Um, and look, a podcast like this can't possibly pick up everything. And I would genuinely be very interested in any thoughts, feedback, comment, etc. that people have in terms of what are they seeing. Um, obviously, appropriately, anonymously, I'm very happy to, to post out what people are seeing or to do a follow up pod- podcast because to an extent, you know, we are all in this together. We're all grappling with a, a, a novel situation, terrible pun intended. Um, and um, to the extent that we can... Uh, on the podcast sort of share some knowledge that I'm very happy to do so um, so so do do um, write in do let me know um, if you have um, any uh, thoughts um, and um, comments on what you are seeing and apropos of that uh, obviously um, my um, email if you want to email me directly n for Nicholas obviously robertson at mayer m-a-y-e-r brown dot com um, I'm on twitter it's nicholas r-o-b-e-r um, one one um, and um, if you do want to get in touch please please do get in touch um, and um, I'll be delighted to hear from you and uh, with what you're seeing um, because we are all going to be seeing these issues coming up whether it's for our clients family members who work and our own businesses so um, what I thought I'd do in this podcast that's a long intro um, but uh, what I thought I'd do in this podcast is a um, look at the short-term issues that are going to fit employers are going to face um, as um, I think in those circumstances um, that's the logical place to start and then we can um, move on to the perhaps the longer term issues that are going to be faced and I'll deal with that in the in the second podcast and perhaps some of the the, the particular challenges and, and questions that we've been asked already about how this is all going to work so let's start with the short term issues so question what are the issues likely to immediately affect staff and employers on a return to work of staff into a more normal working environment? Well, first up, some staff are going to be underutilised. You're, you're going to see, as business picks up, at the initial stages of a return to work, some staff may not be completely utilised. Um, and obviously, if an employer has done the, the um, careful analysis on, on you know, headcount reductions and all that sort of stuff and we'll talk about that in the next podcast um if an employer is wanting to keep staff it needs to think about managing and motivating staff and giving appropriate um uh, assurances to staff that the underutilization is not a precursor to redundancies because in that way you'll lose staff that you would otherwise want to keep so failing to engage in communicating with employees who you want to keep but who are underutilised will result in well demotivation, apathy, uh, perhaps staff looking to leave and go elsewhere to an employer who is saying, come to us, we need you and we'll guarantee that we'll want to keep you. So managing underutilised staff is a challenge and to do that you need to have done some advanced planning who are going to be underutilised staff. Conversely, what about overworked staff? Um, we think there are going to be some areas of business that are there will be pent up and immediate demand for services. And look, just looking at you know, law firms, for example, probably doesn't take a brain the size of a planet to work out that credit control departments are going to be busier than those issuing invoices in the next month or, month or two. Um, so, again, an employer who does advanced planning on this will want to communicate to staff in the overwork departments, look, this is a short-term situation, bear with us. They'll want to think about maybe switching appropriate underutilised staff over to the busier areas. If an employer is doing the planning for that during the lockdown period, it can have communicated to staff, it can have made what it's saying, what, what it thinks clear to staff and why. It can reassure staff, this is a transitional phase, this is not the new normal. Um, but again, it will be making confident planning decisions and communicating them to staff in a way that enables it to best address the challenge. Short-term issue in terms of getting people back to work, one of the things that we're seeing quite a lot of is the idea of um, staff rotation, dividing um, 
um, st- uh, dividing your staff into teams that are effectively isolated um, from each other, so rotating teams in and out of a particular office or work location. Um, I've seen team employers talking about doing two teams. Uh, I was talking to someone the other day who was talking about doing a four-team split with two weeks in an office continuously, um, well, going home at night and weekends, but you know what I mean, and then six weeks out. And the idea is that will effectively um, isolate and insulate teams from each other because there are a number of benefits to the advance. It, it shows to the employees that you are doing advanced planning, you're thinking about the risk of infection at work. Um, you're also, for those of us who work in London at the very least, you're addressing the issue of what the hell do you do about public transport and long commutes. So two weeks in, six weeks off or whatever it is. Um, and obviously underlying all of this is in addition to requiring, is reducing the requirement to attend public working places and public transport, um, is that you, if, if, a, if someone at work gets ill, the risk of transmission throughout a workforce is much less if you've isolated various teams. Um, It also um, has the um, benefit, if you structure a rotation practice, that you avoid a situation where there's a free-for-all. My concern is if you simply say to employees, look, we're not going to force anyone back to work, come in if you want to come in, work from home if you want to work from home, even if that's practical. Um, you end up with a situation where perhaps more junior members of the team are expected to go in and more senior members, aka the older ones, um, decide that they're going to work from home. Um, And I think one of the things that's extremely important is that in any return to work, employers are seen to treat employees fairly and consistently, balanced with, of course, compassion and understanding where there are exceptional circumstances. But a rotation approach would allow you to impose some structure on that. Obviously, there are some challenges to the staff rotation scheme. You've um, got to um, think um, how it will work operationally. How will you manage teams? If you've got one manager and they are managing two or three teams, does that mean the manager is going to be in throughout? Is that right? Or does that have risk of, of transmitting infection across the teams, for example? Is it administratively going to work? But I think it's, at the very, very least, something employers should be thinking about. Um you could do another sort of uh, another set of steps, for example, um, as well, alongside staff rotation or instead of review start and finish times. Can these be allowed to? Can these be adjusted to allow for travel, public transport travel, for example, outside regular hours? Um, avoid crowds of people turning up at the same time and leaving at the same time. Um, can you restrict access, um, for example, to um, particular parts of work premises create zones um, or have um, it create zones within a, a, an office environment where um, you you don't have a throughput of of um, traffic so for example if you have an office on three floors is it going to be understood staff from one floor do not visit staff on another floor it does not happen and you are expected to phone um, or, or whatever um, rather than going and seeing people um, so um, some sort of restriction within the office um, is also, I think, going to be quite an important step. Now, look, obviously, um, businesses aren't all going to have the luxury of implementing um, a staff rotation scheme, for example. Uh, there may be um, too few staff to make this a practical approach. Um, or the work is we require the, the team to be in physically, you know, working on the equipment or whatever it is. But at the very least, explaining to staff that you've considered it as part of a return to work communication. You've considered it, it doesn't work, and whilst other companies can do it, your company can't, again, is going to show that you've thought ahead and done the planning. I mentioned altering hours, and we do think that in many cases that is going to be a very useful way forward uh, for employers um, looking at trying to manage and be seen to manage the return to work process. There's a lot of talk online about managing holiday, um, and that is obviously something that is an immediate issue that should be addressed now, whatever the employer is going to do. There's no suggestion from HMRC that eligibility for receiving a furlough grant is somehow um, prevented by employees, furloughed employees taking holiday. The risk, of course, is that if employees are declining to take holiday, 
at the moment, and let's face it, and that's quite an understandable position, um, employers are going to face a, a holiday, uh, a build-up of holiday, um, which is going to have to be managed because people will be wanting to take holiday when travel restrictions will, um, go, and that's the very time that employers may be wanting them to go back to work, get their nose down and do a load of work. So um, from a legal perspective, one of the things that we think employers should be doing now is looking at um, managing holiday, encouraging people, both staff who are working and those who can't work or those who are furloughed, um, to um, take holiday now. Now, um, obviously, one of the questions for planning purposes is whether the employer is going to go further. Are you going to require people to take holiday? And we are seeing a number of employers do that. Now, it is generally permissible, unless something is said to the contrary in a contract of employment, for the employer to nominate days holiday now obviously that's the biggest stick but even for furloughed employees employers can say we expect you to have taken holiday by a particular period and if you don't we will nominate holiday now um where employers are talking about proportionate amounts of holiday taken you know by a reasonable point throughout the year that's maybe not unreasonable obviously Excuse me. Obviously, if there's a furlough scheme in place and the employer is then effectively <coughs> using the um, uh, furlough scheme to run down the holiday allowance, the holiday entitlement, um, that's uh, well. It, I think it's permissible. Some employers will do that. Some some won't. But I do think, at the very least, an employer needs to be planning now for what it's going to do about holiday entitlement for the rest of the year. One alternative approach is to take advantage of the fact that the government has said that it is permissible to defer up to um, four weeks holiday over the next to over the next two years um, and say to staff now, don't worry about holiday, um, um, taking holiday in the short term. We will allow you to carry holiday over into 2021, for example. One of the advantages of that, um, I think, is that if you think um, that, you know, let's say sometime in June, sometime July, we are travel restrictions, greater freedom of movement is going to happen. And if you think that there's a risk of pandemic two coming, then um, the upshot is going to be that may, a lot of people, if they think the same, are going to want holiday in July and August at a point when the businesses are going to be wanting to get back to work, get running do work um so that would if you've got a requirement that you use all your holiday entitlement in 2020 itself no carryover or no, no more than normal carryover a lot of people are going to want holiday in july and august um so an opportunity to carry over holiday may persuade some people that they would rather have a a, a longer and maybe better holiday in 2021 and so they are willing to take less holiday in 2020 who knows any anyway, point is as i keep saying think about it now um, now, um, the other point, of course, um, is that employers should be should be cautious about pushing deferral of of, of holiday, um, health and safety um, requirements. Um, the um, uh, for holidays mean that um, employers who are um, Preventing is too strong a word, but discouraging holiday, going the other way, go the other way, may have to consider the health and safety implications. This is a stressful time for many people, and holidays are directly linked to an employee's health and safety. And the benefits of holiday, even if you're on furlough, even if you can't work, are still uh, notable. So, um, I think employers need to think about the communication to staff about what is to happen to holiday, as well as the holiday plan that they need to be devising now to put in place for the remainder of this year and possibly into next year. Um, the other point, and this is going to be a theme that we're going to come back to, is we think employers need to be quite careful about not creating divisions amongst the workforce by prioritising remote workers um, uh, for holiday leave over furloughed employees, over working employees. Um, at the first, um, first blush, um, you might think that... Um, it would make sense to prioritise people who've had to work through for holiday as opposed to, let's say, furloughed employees or employees who haven't been working because they can't work from home but they're not been furloughed. <coughs> we think that would be a mistake because I think it's going to be important that you eradicate the distinctions as soon as possible between furloughed and non-furloughed staff or working and non-working staff. 
because you need to bring the workforce back together again and there may be resentments on both sides the furloughed people resent the people who were able to keep working and so on and the working staff resent the people who've been able to sit at home and get paid without working and you need to get past that in order to resume an effective working process so again think about that when you're designing your holiday policy so let's turn a look at operational issues which are likely to affect staff immediately on return or in the very short uh, period after return. First of all, we think employers should be using the time now to look at how business is conducted. And that sounds a very broad proposition. What do I mean? Well, they're going, employers are going to have to reconcile the old way they've done business pre-lockdown with how they're going to do business on return to more normal working. For example, I mean, there's a whole host of these, but let's just pick three. First of all, um, client entertainment. Um, most businesses rely on some form of marketing, client entertainment, etc. Employers are going to have to balance health and safety obligations owed to employees against business development initiatives. Um, if your business development initiatives consists of taking people for meals, going to the Cheltenham races, sporting events, concerts, etc., well, you're going to have to think, rethink all that. Not only have you got health and safety obligations, you might find your clients are less than enthralled at the prospect of going into a crowded environment. So some sort of rethinking of marketing approaches, of marketing approach, going to be essential. What about business travel? Even if it's not for marketing purposes, business travel has been a, an essential part of um, maintaining, running businesses, etc., uh, increasingly more so in recent years. So when the aviation industry becomes operational again, employers are going to have to be very careful about health and safety considerations. What countries can people visit? Who's going to authorise travel? What circumstances is travel going to be permitted? Um, is If it turns out that um, people do have immunity, for example, once they've had coronavirus, are employers going to be making more use of those people who've come through the virus to do travel that might otherwise be denied to those who've not. Obviously, that's something that needs to be thought about very carefully. Um, similarly, um, what about client meetings? Just just doing business. Are you going to have a system where whoever, uh, you know, you're going to, who authorises visitors to come onto your site? And what are the conditions going to be for that? What about supplier meetings? Um, Again, I think staff are going to want to know that employers have thought about this. There should be a policy announced about how this is going to work and what are the safeguards that are going to be put in place. Talking of premises, what about making the employer's premises safe? And obviously, you've got you know factories, office blocks, a whole host of um, different work premises. Um, so it's difficult to generalise, but... Employers are clearly going to have to look at health and safety concerns within the working environment, and employees are going to need to be told that the employer is mindful of this, what's proposed, and what is expected of them. As I say, different working environments are going to have to be dealt with differently. Um, hot desking, shared office, open plan workspaces, etc., throw up particular challenges. Are employers going to install screens around individual workspaces or restrict the number of people who have access to? a hot desking floor, for example, so that the overcrowding is cut back. Um, we've seen examples online, for example, in China, businesses are implementing measures to reinforce social distancing. And one of the things was having meals delivered to employees' desks so as to minimise the usage of communal eating spaces. Um, clearly, um, employers are going to have to do the basics. Hand sanitizer available on work premises, reinforcing messaging about social distancing, reinforcing the essentials around if staff are feeling unwell, they don't come to work. And if they become unwell well at work, where do they go? Who do they tell? There's been a lot of talk about face masks and the effectiveness of face masks in preventing the spread of the virus. We think Employers need to be considering, are they going to encourage face mask wearing during, say, commuting or travelling into work, if it's in public transport? Are they going to be requiring face mask wearing at work? Are they going to be providing face masks? We've, we've heard from those outside the UK that one of the things you have to be very careful about if you are ordering face masks, you don't just put a stock out for people to help themselves to as needed, because people will understandably perhaps, uh, take a few extra. So they need to be allocated, staff would need to be allocated a set number of masks for a set period, set number of days, whatever it is. And that again takes organisation. Uh, we were being told by a client the other day, it's four weeks for ordering face masks from China at the moment. 
Um, so if you're not getting your orders in for face masks, but part of your key part position on coming back to work relies on having face masks, you need to be doing sorting that out now. I suspect many businesses are, but again, we should all be thinking about this. The other point not to lose sight of is that employers have an obligation, a, a legal obligation to report any instances of uh, coronavirus infection which, are, which potentially occurred at work. That's a reportable obligation. There are criminal offences if you don't do that. How are you going to do that if your staff don't know that they should be telling you that that's what's happened? So encouraging staff to report to you um, if they think that there has been an infection at work. That also brings on to the uh, thorny topic of the consideration about virus testing um, or other testing of staff, um, either um, on a regular basis or as a precondition to coming back to work. We're seeing, we're seeing a lot. We're going to see a lot about things like temperature testing, and I suspect we may do a specific uh, Q&A on that uh, in a separate podcast session. But in general terms, the obvious issues are there if there is some form of compulsory or quasi-obligatory testing. There are privacy issues, GDPR challenges that this presents um, that employers need to have thought through and probably taken advice on before they implement. Um, Whatever they're going to do, employers need to be clear with their staff about why they're doing what they're doing. And I think that goes as well if they're not doing virus testing. Because remember, you will have people who will be very concerned about health and safety issues if they do come back to work. So if they, they see other um, people doing virus testing and you're not you need to be explaining why not um, from a privacy perspective we think there's nothing to prevent an employer from requesting that an employee consent to taking a, uh, a test um, but if you're taking that route you really do need to be clear that there is no consequence for refusing to do so and that may then mean that your testing process has got holes in it because people some people will refuse um, what about handling the results of someone testing adversely or or whether or not they, 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 it's the employer's tests? What about an employee who rings up one day and says, I, I've, I've gone down with the virus? Um, you need to be very clear about what you're going to tell people um, who may have come into contact with them. Are you going to disclose the identity um, of uh, the particular individual? The um, ICO guidance note says that that will not generally be necessary. Um, and we think it may be the answer to it depends precisely on how closely you think an individual may have come into contact uh, with an infected person and whether it's relevant to that person to know who it was uh, who's got infected for their own health and safety. Obviously, as well, GDPR, the the whole processing of employees' medical data, testing data, etc., is going to have to be carefully thought through from a GDPR perspective. It's, it's effectively sensitive personal data. And so there are restrictions um, on its processing, retaining and or processing uh, that data. Um, we think most employers, where they are choosing to do some form of testing, are going to say it's necessary to comply with their legal obligations in relation to health and safety. Um, and... Um, I think, frankly, it would be a, a brave you know, court or tribunal or indeed the ICO uh, if they were going to say, you know, if that's been done in good faith, it's wrong, it oversteps the mark. So we think in practice that may be something that is, is less likely to be challenged, provided it's been done in good faith and in a sensible fashion. Um, and obviously, you're going to need to think if you're doing testing or whatever about um, potentially vulnerable groups. I have no idea, you know, do pre or pregnant women, will the tests be as effective for pregnant women are the particular health issues ditto disabled employees again common theme think ahead think ahead it, on the theme of thinking ahead planning for pandemic two now and when you go back to work in case there's a further lockdown in september one of the things that medical experts have been warning about is the potential second wave um for the pandemic um Obviously, in the absence of a vaccine, and it looks pretty unlikely there'll be one this year, any relaxation of lockdown increased the chances of that sort of second lockdown coming. So um, use the time now and in the immediate return to work to collate the experience of people who've been affected at your work um, by the previous lockdown. Talk to furloughed employees, talk to employees working remotely, talk to those who are responsible for managing the business to look at areas of your business where your operations were robust and your operations could have been improved. Obviously, by 
taking a whole range of um, experiences on board, the employer would be in a better position to meet any pandemic too. Um, and, you know, the experiences of someone on furlough may be very different from someone who was trying to work normally but had two young kids. So what could the employer have done better? What did the employer do well and just need to keep doing more of the same? The other point, of course, is employees will feel valued and given the opportunity to talk through their experiences about life uh, getting through this and think that the employer has an interest in them as people, which I think is going to be part of the key for getting people back into the working environment, working effectively. Um, the other thing is, um, in, the, in the context of um, looking at how what business is doing, is just rethinking the business cycle. There's some bits that we fixed. If you're a tax year, then certain things have got to happen in connection with a tax year. That's not going to change. But, you know, if you do annual appraisals in on the 1st of June every year, why, oh, why, oh, why are you going to do annual appraisals on the 1st of June this year? There's no requirement to do it. It's just a self-imposed schedule. It's always been that way. Maybe you want to think about changing that schedule. There might be an argument for saying, well, we'll we can do that stuff while we're all in lockdown. So we'll bring it forward. Great. Or it might be you, you go, we'll, we'll, we'll push that to the autumn. While first priority on the 1st of June, let's pretend that's going to be when normal working starts or more normal working starts. Let's get back, back to normal working before we worry about the annual appraisal round. So thinking about those things, we think, is going to be very important. So that's the, the that's some of the, the short-term issues. Um, Next podcast that I do will be on longer term issues and some related points, as well as some of the questions that we've been asked in connection with the return to work. Um, and um, I'm happy to pop, pop those out on a podcast. So that'll come out in a few days time. But anyway, in the meantime, I hope you found this useful. Do do get in touch. Do let me know if you've had any thoughts or experiences um, in terms of what clients are asking you or what your employer is asking you. Um, because, as I say, we're all in this together, and I'm very happy to pass on any stories, suitably anonymized, um, and experiences or thoughts, um, and um, share generally. So in the meantime, um, stay safe, everyone, and um, I'll see you for Podcast 175. Take care. So that concludes this podcast. We hope that you find it and others in the series helpful. If you have any comments or questions or want to know how to claim continuing education credits, please email Nick at nrobertson at mayorbrown.com. Thank you for listening to the podcast.